the greatest poems, I think, come from a place that no one can quite account for. There's always a mysterious aspect about where they came from. There are moments in living when certain simple acts take on a kind of joyous or celebratory intensity. This poem is about one of those acts, one of those moments. It's called From Blossoms. From blossoms comes this brown paper bag of peaches we bought from the boy at the bend in the road where we turned towards signs painted peaches. From laden boughs, from hands, from sweet fellowship in the bins comes nectar at the roadside, succulent peaches we devour, dusty skin and all comes the familiar dust of summer, dust we eat. Oh, to take what we love inside, to carry within us an orchard, to eat not only the skin, but the shade, not only the sugar, but the days, to hold the fruit in our hands, adore it, then bite into the round jubilance of peach. There are days we live as if death were nowhere in the background, from joy to joy to joy, from wing to wing, from blossom to blossom to impossible blossom to sweet impossible blossom. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning, I did the work I love. At noon, I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day, I know, it will be otherwise. who specialized in a very particular kind of metaphor, the conceit, as I say, the extended metaphor that found a likeness between two unlike things and then sort of dragged it out, drew it out, like gold to airy thinness beat, as somebody puts it. So sort of beating the thing out, finding every connection, the extended metaphor. So I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the outrageous, the outlandish metaphor, uh, the finding of you know, connections that are far flung, and um, and yet one hopes illuminating, illuminating.
wild geese. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over announcing your place in the family of things. it comes from that place of unknowing and it touches that place of unknowing. The poem is, has the title from a bus window in central Ohio just before a thunder shower. Cribs loaded with roughage, huddled together before the north clouds. The wind tiptoes between poplars. The silver maple leaves squint toward the ground. An old farmer, his scarlet face apologetic with whiskey, swings back a barn door and calls a hundred black and white Holsteins from the clover field. That would seem inoffensive enough. Uh, it's not going to uh, make Sophocles move over or anything like that. But there, there's a, a critic who was really outraged by that. He was just stopping there on the bus. How did he have time to count 100 cows? Robert Bly and I read that. We actually were going to put the answer on a postcard and send it to him. We never did. We were going to write, Dear Mr. So-and-so, I counted the tits and divided by four. <laughs> difficult to encourage people who are not interested to read poetry. And the fact of the matter is that most of us, most of us have a really bad time with poetry. For most of us it begins in high school, if not earlier. And somehow uh, children of eight or nine or ten indeed are actually very um, comfortable with reading and indeed writing poetry. Uh, something strange happens to us around right about the time of puberty. Of course, we know there are a number of strange things happen to us. But for whatever reason, round right about that time, and I think it's more than you know the the fact that we're going through that change in life. 
I think it has to do more often than not with how poetry is taught in secondary or high school. And for some reason, from the age of 12 or 13 onwards, poetry means only some form of doggerel. It usually means some fifth-rate version of Dr. Seuss or Shel Silverstein or one of those poets. And that's what 13-year-olds write. When they're not doing that, they've been instructed in the history. Maybe if they're very lucky, they've been instructed in the history of American or English or indeed Irish. And what's usually happening there is that the instructor, the teacher, is at pains to show what an extraordinary instructor or teacher she or he is. And the message I think that far too many of us get in high school is that poetry may only be read if you've got that instructor or teacher to show you what it's really about.
the next one's coming.